our uh, our uh, schematic. And yeah, this is uh, the book that I mentioned earlier. So it's uh, from our CEO and also the, our co You, If you are interested in like, try to uh, figure out what's uh, this book in the uh, video as well. So yeah, just a bit more about myself. So I'm Bacon. Uh, I joined the uh, SkyMind for a few months. Uh, prior to this, I was a uh, uh, data scientist in Sigisha. If you guys are uh, not about Sigisha, maybe the, the closer brand name that you might know is Jobstreet or Jobstreet. So, um, in, in Jobstreet or Sigisha, I actually help company to, to build those uh, job recommendation engines, also some of the placement prediction models. So imagine that placement prediction is basically like once after you apply to a job, how was the likelihood of you getting the placement? So yeah, these are uh, some of the products that we built in Job Street. And then prior to that, I was some uh, I was the software engineer in some of the software companies. And and yeah, I was graduated from uh, this. But um, yeah, as a research trainee in computer vision. Okay, so let's talk about AI. So AI is not new, definitely. So it was uh, it was created since uh, uh, 1950, where the first uh, the first AI term is actually come by uh, John McCann. So during the 1956. So after after uh, quite some years, uh, there's uh, some so-called AI term where where AI technology couldn't be, be actually enhanced more due to uh, lack of uh, competence, uh, computational uh, efficiency. And, and this start actually uh, came back on uh, after the 1990s, so where, where people start starting to, to actually build uh, alpha rules. People start to use, uh, utilize deep learning technology to actually create more accurate prediction models. So this this uh, this slide is actually from Vertex Venture, so they will see that after another 50, 50 years, so AI could actually uh, achieve some kind of uh, human level of intelligence. So a bit more about uh, AI. So basically AI is the, the broadest term, so the, the, the big angle. So machine learning is a subset of is basically a subset of AI. And deep learning is a subset. Uh, of question. So you can see that uh, from 1980s, there are a lot of uh, different approach that uh, we can use to actually model the prediction model. For example, random forest, Bayesian, uh, network, and some machine. So uh, people who actually work on data might, might be familiar with all this technique, but uh, with the race of uh, machine learning, this approach is getting, getting uh, Things. So why now? Why AI? Why deep learning at this moment? So the first the first reason why is because of the faster and more powerful computation GPUs. We can use the GPU to, to basically train our model. Uh, if you have a lot of data, if, uh, you you can't really train with uh, CPU because you are going to wait for for weeks. So the second reason is uh, basically uh, because of the greater data volume. Companies trying to actually collect more and more data, logs data, transactional data. Yeah, I, I heard that some company that actually push their data every two years. So so basically that's the reason because we, we can have a much more better use of uh, data with data. So there are also uh, some other reasons like development of new algorithms. Like, uh, I, I think recently you guys might um, know about FaceApp. So that's kind of a neural network um, uh, model as well in, in terms of how to translate your, your face to, to uh, older, older age audience. So, so uh, tech giants like Facebook, uh, Google, SkyMind is actually, they are trying to actually uh, open up their resources. Like TensorFlow, PyTorch, you can see all of uh, all this uh, available framework 
in order to build, build your deep learning model, right? So they are, they are not stingy about their technology anymore. They open up for the community, let the company grow, and also in terms of contributing their, their, their technology. And also the last one is basically the cloud, cloud infrastructure. So, so you no longer need to maintain or purchase your hardware on, on premise. With a few clicks, you can you can launch up a cluster of uh, servers from tens to thousands. So this is no longer a limitation in, in, in for for So there are a lot of um, areas uh, for AI. So there are Rubies, there are uh, machine learning, there are deep learning, and people might focusing on uh, neural network processing in terms of how to understand your text. Uh, machine, uh, machine vision, autonomous uh, speed design, and so on. So people might wonder what is the difference between uh, when, when we talk about AI, machine learning, deep learning. What is data science? So data science is basically another domain or or role that uh, people might uh, or data scientists might actually wonder how to best utilize data and also algorithm. So they are not really, they are, they are not those people that are actually focusing much on deep learning, but they can actually utilize this, this, this approaches or, or uh, techniques in terms of uh, analyze the data or come up with certain uh, model that uh, better than, than previous uh, machine learning approach. So, yeah, this is the stages of AI. So, we, we, talk, about, uh, we talk about a lot of AI, but there are a few categories of AI. So the, the most simplest one is F, uh, artificial narrow intelligence, which your your model or your AI can only be focused on, focusing on single task. For example, let's say my model good at predicting the customer what customer will buy, for example. So that particular AI engine is only capable of doing one one task. So the next one is about uh, artificial general intelligence. Which is this one is uh, more robust in, in terms of is closer to uh, what human can can actually achieve. I think we know how to predict, we know how to walk, we know how to sense, and yeah. So so AGI is more more powerful as in it can actually do what uh, can perform multiple tasks. As is so, and super the ASI I guess. I don't think we will uh, discuss this more because I don't think any, any tech challenge that is able to actually uh, achieve this stage and for, for now. So, I, I guess you guys might familiar with autonomous car and also uh, Sophia. So, Sophia is one of the key, uh, she basically just got the citizenship, uh, few years back, she got the citizenship of the Saudi Arabia. So it's a robot, but uh, in, in terms of uh, how, how do we categorize all those uh, AI techniques that we have right now? So it's somehow it's still in between AI and AI and also AI. Yeah, let's go into uh, machine learning. So usually our data scientists work, work a lot, uh, a lot, uh, work a lot with the data and machine learning. So they, they usually get a lot of uh, chunk of data and then they try to understand the data and try to model the uh, model the, the prediction model based on historical data and then use it to predict any transaction that come in the future. So there are a lot of approaches that we should really support the machine and some are uh, like teaming clustering in order to, to cluster some of the uh, data based on similarities. So these are the, some of the uh, conventional approach of uh, machine learning, like vision tree. So we can, uh, based, uh, if you have a data, you, you have label data, then you can use vision tree to actually help you to split up based on the, the patterns and, and uh, the, the, the difference in, in the classes. So when you have, uh, once you build your vision tree, you, you are able to productionize your model and do some prediction in the production. So, this is a sample of uh, uh, the typical machine uh, techniques. 
So this is another view of what I mean by relation to it. So imagine the, the left hand side, you have your data with, together with your spaces, right? Imagine you have multiple spaces and you're trying to, uh, trying to predict your spaces based on the features that you have on the left hand side. So based on circle length, uh, pattern length, and so on. So once you fit your, your data set into the decision uh, tree, then you will get something like imagine the right right hand side. Where you try to uh, try to split up each of the class. So imagine if you have a uh, you have a picture without without uh, spaces, right? You can traverse through through this tree, this tree, and then you will reach a loop that that you can use as your image. So yeah, four types of learning. Uh, one is uh, supervised learning. So supervised learning is applicable when you have um, labeled data. So imagine that you collect the data and then you know which class or uh, which label your, your data points belongs. So uh, the second is unsupervised learning where you can't really tell the model about your labels. So uh, what unsupervised learning can do is basically it's based on your data, the data set that you contribute, and then you try to figure out uh, what's the similarity between your data. And then you try to cluster, you try to cluster your, your model, and then try to differentiate one from each other. So semi-supervised learning is, uh, is actually a hybrid of uh, supervised and unsupervised, where you have some levels of your data point and not all of them. And reinforcement learning is, is quite famous in recent years because uh, uh, this, and this is a, a technique where we can uh, basically have an agent to basically work, to automate the process um, of the learning in a control environment. So imagine if I want to try uh, train a robot to, to play basketball. So if it's, if the robot is able to uh, score, meaning I, I reward the, the model with that one. And if, if it's cool, then I minus uh, I basically give a negative reward. So by by trying a lot of iteration, your, your robot knows how to how to how to play basketball. Yeah, so this is a just a recap. And supervised learning is a classroom. We don't know the label of these items and we try to cluster. Supervised learning where you have all your labels on your data set and then you try to have a decision model, something uh decision body to actually your model to differentiate these two items. And semi-supervised where you have a uh, portion of your labels. Yeah, let's go into uh, more uh, details of, uh, or maybe the fundamentals of machine uh, learning. So when we when we build a model in uh, using deep learning, we don't really uh, the, the computer won't understand your your colors, your your, your height, your your the shape, for example. But what what computer knows is basically. Uh, numbers and, and binaries. So it, in a, uh, linear algebra is important. Uh, this is the fundamental, uh, fundamental of the um, because uh, we need to have that some uh, basically, uh, basic knowledge of this before we proceed because a lot of the architecture that I'm going to mention later on is basically dependent on this. So when we talk about scalar, it's basically one Vectors is a array of data. Matrix is a two-dimensional array. And tensor is something which is basically uh, describing an array that has an n-dimensional three to one or x. So hyperplane. So in in, in a two-dimensional space, uh, when we draw a digital boundary, it's basically a line. So hyperplane is something that uh, if it's going uh, more than two, two dimensional, we call it as kind of plane where, where is the, the plane they actually, actually exists in three dimension. So dot product is, uh, is common in uh, metric uh, multi uh, map. So you need to understand how, how this dot product works. And also 
how to actually solve uh, system unity. So imagine that you have uh, imagine that you have these, these two equations. Right? You need to actually find out the, the x and the x too. So in, in deep learning, we utilize a lot of matrices, which is the letters. So uh, because if, if you are going to uh, solve the equation uh, by substitution, right? So it is going to be a chaos because a lot of computation need to be done. And yeah, so so yeah, we will be going to need to give about the matrices um, computational. So yeah, two type of uh, system, two uh, of methods in terms of solving the system equation. So that's the direct method and also the iterative method. Uh, methods. So direct methods meaning that uh, you basically need to load all your all your data set. Let's say that you have one million one million of records. So if you if you want to solve the equation this time, right? Imagine that you have one one million of records. You need to load all your data into the memory, and then you need to compute in order to come up with a with a simple x on x to this. So what? So basically, uh, the bottom one is basically the, the point why we don't don't encourage. Uh, um, it's not wise to use direct method in, in this case, as in uh, not all methods can be for example, if you are using non equation and an iterative method can be more effective if you are, uh, if you want to uh, if you deal with a lot of data. So this is the iterative method that I mentioned. So in, in terms of iterative, meaning I actually go through uh, a series of steps of elements. So uh, imagine that if you have uh, one minutes record, you can actually uh, put that uh, put that into batches. For example, we process hundred by hundred or thousand by thousand. This so the most common method of this uh, 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 methods is uh, SGD, stochastic gradient descent. So, so what is this for? So we basically just a method for us to actually optimize the objective function. So I, I will talk more about objective function later on. So very many things. So yeah. So basically, this is just a Using direct methods and also iterative methods. So I think the 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 main the main uh, point here is iterative method uh, consumes less memory compared to direct methods. Yeah, let's talk about deep learning. So yeah, so deep learning is why it's for. So what I'm showing here is this is a subset of architecture that that uh, inside the deep learning series. Uh, so so let, let's start with something maybe uh, very simple first. Why why we uh, use deep learning? So so what the, the main reason why why we encourage the use of deep learning compared to others learning algorithm is uh, deep learning able to actually perform better with more data compared to uh, other algorithms. Two, so it's about uh, automatic uh, feature extraction. So when you deal with images, text, and also spatial, so if you are using a, a conventional uh, machine learning technique, you need to perform extra step where you actually need to perform manual feature extraction. So this reminds me uh, time is back. I was involved in uh, some computer vision project where. I need to actually segment uh, the level areas of the uh, MRI pictures. So that time we don't really uh, use a lot of data. So that time I still remember that we need to actually uh, traverse through all the images pixel by pixel and calculate the, the texture value for, for each of the uh, patches that we extract. But now, what, uh, if we are using deep learning, you no longer need to actually do the extra step whereby uh, CNN or this deep learning technique able to uh, perform on the multi-level of uh, feature extraction. And yeah. So another reason of uh, deep learning is uh, global performance. 
So imagine that if you are using some linear linear uh, linear uh, regression or some uh, total information techniques. So the the algorithm or the approach might not be sufficient for you to actually draw up all the boundaries in terms of separating uh, A versus B, for example. Yeah, let's uh, you move into uh, deep learning. So deep learning is basically uh, the underlying uh, approaches is, is the new networks. So imagine that uh, we have uh, deep learning, uh, artificial new network is trying to mimic the how how human brains work. You know, where you have uh, gun drive and new neuron, and we try, uh, we're trying to stimulate how the data processing is now So imagine this uh, simple uh, neural network where we have input, hidden layer, and also output. So input basically is your data, your features. So imagine if you are trying to classify uh, whether it's a gross or some, some other form, right? the input can be a number of petals or what's the colors and so on. The hidden layer here is basically an abstraction of the input. So there will, there will be a lot of uh, aromatic uh, happening in, in the human being. And the output is basically the power of prediction. And, and whether it's a gross or some other one. Like so we call this hidden layer as a layer. So imagine that if we have more layers, right, it's going to be a uh, deep neural network. So this is the most uh, fundamental neural network. So let's zoom into a single uh, hidden, hidden nodes. So imagine that uh, each of these nodes, right, we will, we will get input from previous layer, and then there will be some bits. We will basically to amplify whether whether the, whether that particular feature is important or not, and then we will aggregate some some um, uh, some and also some non-linear activity and contribute to output. So. Imagine each, each of the nodes you have this this one. This in this one. Okay. So we talk about the, the structure for for the process. So basically you can see that this this, this equation that I'm right, right? It's basically the, the basically this is the automatic behind that uh, power this. So basically we are trying to sum the way and also the, the features for, come from each node and also uh, get active uh, past the bias and also G uh, is basically an activation function so that you can actually translate your state to, to uh, uh, non linear -non So the, the bottom one is basically a, a more simplified uh, uh, animation where we use, because this I mentioned right? When we have a lot of aromatic uh, running in neural network, it's not wise to actually to compute one by one. So basically, we, uh, the, the simplified version is we basically translate all of this data in, in the form of matrices. And you can see x and y. X is basically your input, and v is basically your, your uh, weight for individuals. So yeah. So we have, we can see the G G is basically the activation function. So what is what is activation function? So the purpose of activation function is basically to introduce a non linear entities to the level. Imagine, imagine there's something that uh, imagine this this case right where your your problem is very complex and it couldn't be solved with uh, linear activation. So by introducing the non linear entities, it allows our model to be more complex. So these are some of the activation functions that I will do. I think uh, the I think the most uh, famous one is value. Well, compared to the rest, uh, um, yeah, there's some some scenario that we might depend on that change or uh, sigma, but I think for for now you guys can just understand this as uh, activation function. So. Yeah, we have our input, we have our hidden layers, and so now we talk about the, the upper layer. So it depends what kind of scenario that 
problems that we are trying to tackle. Right? So if you are trying to do uh, some classification to differentiate A and B, then you can use binary classification or use the sigmoid function at the uh, upper layer. Or if you are dealing with multiple uh, multi-class classification, if you have uh, something to predict that there's more than two classes. So you, you may perform uh, some max uh, activation at, at your layers. So basically deep neural network is basically saying that if I have hidden layer more than one, then it's considered deep. So for, for sure the, the deeper the network, the, the capability of your the ability of your neural network to to model the complexity of the problem is is uh, is uh, increased as well. So yeah. So let's take one example. So imagine right. Uh, this is a simple problem that we can to solve. So imagine the x-axis is the number of lecture that you have, and then the y-axis is uh, our span on the final project. So the red dot and the green dot is basically based on historical data. And we have uh, one, one unforeseen data there morning, which is data data, and we try to know whether I'm going to pass the, the past this class or not. So what's your answer? Am I going to pass the pass the class? Yeah, so this is on the historical data or the model can do is basically draw the history model. And then whatever uh, new data for that is, it is closer to meaning that I'm going to pass. So so what happened? What happened if your if your model say you are not going to pass? So that's a place, uh, that's a step where we actually need to quantify our losses. So imagine you fit in the uh, uh, 4 and 5 and this one will be around 4 and 5, pass it into the x1 and x2. Then you flow over to the hidden layer and output has uh, 0 0.1. So 0 0.1 here is basically a positive value from 0 to 1. So 0 0.1 means that you have actually 10% of uh, getting getting predicted as uh, pass. So basically saying that you are not going to pass. So how about the model? Learn? The model need some kind of indicator in, in terms of measuring how well the model is predicted right now. So in this case we need to measure the loss. So the actual the actual value is one but the model currently is just predicted at 0.1. So the, the loss will be 0.9, right? So because it's far away from, from the actual actual time. So so yeah, so when we deal with data set, we are not only dealing with one data point. We are going to deal with a lot of more data points. So imagine we have millions of uh, data set. Basically we need to we need to actually find out all the losses for individual data point and evaluation. So so basically this, this formula or this function is basically the objective function or the cost function that uh, we is commonly use in in the So cost function can come came in many ways. So we are using classification, like you can doing classification problem, right? You can use binary cost entropy, you can use uh, negative log value and so on. And regression problem we can use MS. Yes, so these are just all the alternatives or, or some of the uh, potential loss functions that you can use while building your new network. So, so the model is being done by minimizing the loss. Meaning the loss. So as long as my, my model is converging closer to smaller loss, meaning that my, my model is learning in this case. So there are two phases of uh, neural network. So one is called forward propagation. Forward propagation is basically uh, when you have uh, you have your input data, right? You try to map to, to the predicted labels. And then because we know all the labels, after the uh, forward propagation we calculate the the, the errors. And then use that particular errors to basically do a back 
cargo population. So that's the time where we use all the errors to basically fine tune our weight and biases to basically let that model. So imagine that if we have a lot of information that let's say we forward and drive a pass for 4,000 times. So the model will be trying to learn by adjusting the weights in each iteration. So it's going to learn bit by bit and trying to be better from time to time. So that, that's the, basically that's the training piece. So the second one is inference. Inference basically uh, means that uh, when we done with the modeling or the training, we want to deploy the, the model into production and and to be used for some sort of product features for the model. So inference only involve uh, forward propagation. Then we actually come to the left to right and then we get the predicted value at the end of the model. So training the network is basically what's the goal of the network? So the goal of the network is basically the try to learn and basically adjust the weights and bias from time to time so that it can uh, well fit the, the data parts that we have in, in the dimensions. Okay. Before I proceed, maybe I should ask, are you guys alright? And or any any question before before I proceed? So optimization, okay, that comes the optimization, how the model is. So this one we mentioned about back optimization, right? Where, where um, the network trying to adjust this uh, law uh, weight and biases. So it's basically done by this, this optimization model, right? where, where um, you're trying to actually traversal through the, the imagine this uh, the loss term. So you're trying to find out the, the Delta in between and trying to trying to adjust the weight and biases from time to time so that you get the, the, the optimal form. So there are, there are a lot of hyperparameters in, in the um, new network. One of these is learning rate. So basically this means that um, how big is your steps in order to change? So imagine if you have a big learning rate, right? So the, the the optimization cannot be smooth because it keeps jumping here and there based on uh, if you have a big learning rate then your your uh, your loss might keep oscillating and you cannot really accomplish the optimal point. But if you are trying to reduce a small learning rate, it, it can be really accomplished better, but that's it if you can use a uh, cause as well. As in, it couldn't really, um, it, 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 it would potentially drop uh, fall into the local minimum. Local minimum here uh, is basically the optimal, uh, the solution that, not really the, the, the best solution that we might potentially have. So, so a lot more about uh, cost function. So, when we deal with non linear uh, linearity, because this one we mentioned about we, we add a lot of activation function right into the linear. And then uh, the loss function that uh, that form is basically not non convex. I see they have a lot of uh, smaller than uh, local minimum form. So so in, in deep learning, our main objective is not to find the the, the best or the lowest point of the of the loss, but to, to basically to find a more acceptable uh, range of the loss. So imagine that the global cost of the right next we, we might know that this, is, this might be the, the best solution that we might have, but to, in some extent, local cost of the might, might be sufficient for us to actually deploy our model. So it's it not necessary to be perfect in this case. So within this sense, this is how, 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 how we perform the optimization. So, so there are three types of gradient design here. So one is, uh, the first one is stochastic gradient design. 
So stochastic behavior is random. So we randomize one sample from, from the data set and then we try to, try to find out the loss and basically let the model learn based on the, the, uh, the loss that we have, based on one single sample. So the, the, the drawback of this is uh, in terms of optimizing, uh, optimization, the path is going to be zigzag, but um, uh, the strategy is basically is fast because when we only deal with one single, one single sample, meaning that yeah, we don't really need to do a lot of computation with some other data. So mini bash really design, which is um, you can you can basically define your mini bash. It can be 10, 20, and 30. So I mean, what was the difference between mini bash and also we actually consider the best size that we have. For example, this time we, we, we uh, optimize based on one single sample. Right now we optimize based on 20 or 30 samples. So in this sense, so your, your optimization might, might be more stable compared to only one sample because uh, the samples, if you are just depending on one single sample, it will be random as in your path will not be, be, be smooth. I have to show you the specialization of this tree later on. So another approach is the batch within the sense, which is uh, we're trying to optimize based on the entire the whole universe. So I think the, the drawbacks of this is basically the computation. Because if you are going to compute the whole data set, you need to load all into your memory and so this this will be kind of the, the visual or, or the effect of using different kind of gradient uh, descent. So you can see that the stochastic gradient descent is more noisy, as in the path is exact because when you rely on one single simple sample, the, the the effect of the optimization might not be that great. So mini batch is for compared to uh, best readings then, but somehow it's still it's still acceptable in terms of uh, optimization. Yeah, so so usually we in in deep learning, I guess, from from my own experience, we use a lot of uh, mini best readings because we cannot really bear with the batch and so I think it's random. So sometimes we just play around with So again, this is just a single step from what we have to sell, creating more forward forward and backward propagation, and influence this in more forward uh, propagation. So how, how do we evaluate our um, training? How, how do we know that um, your model is going to accomplish or perform better from time to time? So usually um, when we perform training, we have some visualization on the score. Ideally, your, your scores should be converging to, to a lower loss lower, uh, lower in the left hand side. So, there will be a time where you uh, will get a, a, a straight line where, where your um, model cannot be, uh, cannot be enhanced from you. So, there are also some, some techniques that are conditional method. F1 uh, score that people like to use to actually evaluate the model. So imagine that this confusion metric right, uh, is uh, when I perform a M class classification. So the horizontal one is the, the actual label, and then the, the column wise is basically the, the predicted label. So from this, this basically is a confusion metric where you can actually have a rough idea of how, how your model performs. Like for example, in this case, 958 of the data point of mine belongs to uh, class 0, classified as class 0. So it's good, right? So, yeah, this is this, this just some, some method that you, you can, uh, can cross-check your model whether it's good. Yeah, so that's not sure, right? There's a lot of architectures that uh, we can type in. Uh, so, <coughs> so if you are there, yeah, yeah, 
yeah, basically just a simple guide on which, which architecture that you, you might, might want to try out. So if you're building a structured data set, let's say you have a CSV uh, with a column that label, you might want to try out a multi-layer uh, multi system. So basically it's just a simple, simplest uh, new network that you can have. That you, uh, all the bottom is basically in the unit of your input. And the output is based on your, your series. So conversion new network is put in, in terms of uh, if you want to classify if you deal with images. So you can use conversion network in terms of uh, image classification as well. So recurrent neural network are these are this this uh, robust when you are dealing with sequential data, like for example text and speeches. So it also includes some of the uh, sequential data, like for example uh, stock market uh, data points. You want to uh, predict the stock market for the next day, right? So you can look the sequence of data from day to day, hours by hours, and fit into this and so that's it. So GAN, I think GAN is good in terms of uh, geometry. So I guess you guys might have a lot of uh, people on the news that are saying uh, AI is able to generate images and so on. So GAN is a generative uh, adversary network where it can try to mimic how, how, um, how artists draw and how to generate images. So these are just different architecture that, that in the neural network. So auto recorder and Bridge uh, is uh, famous for uh, dimensional reduction and also memory detection. So and that they are long. And I believe I, I couldn't really handle or understood all, all the architecture because it's really a lot. For example, guns they are, they are, they are already for example guns right there are already thousands of possible architecture that devices can be. So, if you're interested, maybe you can pick up one of these areas and try to look into it and build it. So, yeah, I speak quite um, some for deep learning. And now I'm going to introduce the deep learning project. So, basically, this is uh, an uh, open source deep learning framework that uh, enables us to actually build models based on Java and stuff. So, I, I think you guys might have so those, those framework uh, only works when you deal with Python. So I'm not going to do any comparison with it. <laughs> That's so cool and so uh, the project, but these are another, another alternative that you might, you might look into. So the goal of uh, deep learning, this, this framework is basically uh, enable uh, integration with big data ecosystem because I believe you guys are aware of uh, Kafka, Spark, Hadoop. Those, those big, uh, big data applications is all written in Java. So there, there are some potential exceptions where, where uh, this deep learning uh, project framework right, can be seen on top of those applications. One thing for robust, I think, is that this is the idea. Uh, so, yeah, I mentioned about deep learning project. So these are uh, actually, this uh, deep learning project didn't keep alone, uh, didn't keep alone because it utilizes uh, some of the libraries like and the and the deep and the project, uh, is something that's similar to NumPy in Python. So it's robust in terms of uh, doing deep algebra and CPU and also GPU. So there are also some other project that um, uh, some of you said said the deep learning uh, the project is the data back where you can use it for data ingestion, mobilization, and so on. So, same diff is basically just uh, the underlying uh, methods that we use to actually do a differentiation and computation. Uh, Arbiter where you can use it to optimize your hyperparameters. So, uh, if you guys are familiar with uh, some of this machine learning technique, you might have you might expose to grid search and so on. For example, you can pass in, like for example, run, uh, decision tree, right? I don't know what's the best parameter that 
that um, that sweet in my in my memories. I don't know how many level of trees purple melts in, in my in my in my memories. So I think in in optimizing uh, in optimizing the hyperparameter, you can provide what parameter hyperparameter that you wish to actually try out. Let's say I can I can actually specify my three levels as three, four, five. And then let the let the arbiter of the, the optimization to figure out whether three, four, or five best suit your your scenarios. So there are also RFOG, it's our reinforcement learning on JVM. And model import that you can actually uh, import your big model from TensorFlow Cafe and so on. So imagine that if, if you want to Deploy your your tensor model in production, right? You might choose tensors, tensor serving or, or some some other um, custom API. So another alternative is that uh, you can use this uh, model port to basically to, to serve your your model in production. Where you can load and do prediction on this port. Jump by is just another button you can go in. So. Yeah, this is basically a paper where they are trying to summarize what are the, the <coughs> possible tools or ever tools that are available across, across the world. So, in terms of statistics, um, I think I, I don't really need to go at all, but I think the only advantage of the LPG in this sense is it's able to work with memory. If you are familiar with Hadoop and Spark, um, so basically it's saying that you can actually uh, use the LPG on Spark or Hadoop to best utilize your cluster computation, where you can distribute your job to different nodes of your cluster. And and yeah, it is basically in terms of performance. So there are also some other uh, deep learning frameworks. So we can see that <coughs> some 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 of these frameworks are the core uh, deep learning framework and some of it is basically an abstract. So for example, take take a look at the Keras and the right? So Keras is basically just a wrapper or uh, abstraction that you can actually make use of Tensorflow and so on. Some of the library to to, to, to build a deep learning framework. So you can see that uh, deep learning for the MH2 is basically able to support the Apache Spark, where you can basically, uh, you, you can best utilize the faster computing in terms of managing your, your model building. So, yeah, a lot of uh, all this framework is actually uh, compatible with CVN. So basically, this, this library able to, to compute on GPUs. So why GPUs is again uh, compared to CPU is have a lot of calls and imagine your, your laptop CPU has only 8 or 16 calls but uh, GTX uh, on the file uh, NVIDIA GPU can have up to uh, hundreds of calls. So in terms of computation uh, we would suggest you to actually so yeah. So some other uh, other key point that why why we why we use the the project the project. So the underlay linear uh, algebra computation, which is performed under any project with C++ engine. So imagine that all your code is written in in Java, but the metric computation is done on C++. Where there's an intermediate layer where we call it Java CPU, where you're trying to translate all your Java code to, to, to C++ for humanity. So the supported backend, Google, uh, OpenDAS, Intel, MKL, I think there are some of the uh, solutions that we can, we can actually um, utilize on, on our laptop and also servers. So in terms of realism, yeah, the opposite is good. I think it can actually uh, 
you can automatically set up all those uh, fields and connection when you run it on distributed uh, distributed uh, computing, for example, Spark and Mind. So yeah, I think you guys might wonder how how do I get started in the only so basically uh, you might need some basic on uh, Java application, Java development, like uh, Maven. So in, in Python, we have Pip to manage our package. In Java, we have uh, Maven to actually uh, for us to uh, control our dependencies. So if you have a Maven project, as long as you include these two uh, libraries, then you are able to actually um, to, to train, uh, you are able to train them. So, how the style look like? So, I believe most of you is um, not more familiar with Python, but in Java, we, we provide this builder style coding where you can actually uh, specify this how, how you design your new network. So, imagine this uh, two layer new network with dense layer, one, is, uh, one, hidden, uh, one dense layer with one output. So, yeah, this is how you, this way you can configure your network. We will go through some demo and example here. Yeah, so these are all the network configuration that that I will do. For the first seat, seat, seat is is needed when you want to make your model training distributed, deterministic. So <coughs> because because uh, new network do uh, involve a lot of randomization. So if you are training your model right now, right? If you want to show to your boss later on, you want to train it again, and all of a sudden your model is, is different because of the randomization mechanism. So, if you want to make your, your um, result producible, so you might want to set uh, a seed so that uh, your model will learn in, in, in the specific way. Best size is uh, how many, how many best size you want to um, consider uh, during your training. Forward pass and also back population. Epoch is basically how many, how many, how many epoch, epoch, epoch what epoch is basically means that the fully pass of your entire data set. Let's say you have 1 million records. So once you fit your 1 million data set, uh, uh, 1 million record into the network, meaning you are, you are done with 1 epoch. So imagine when we train, you are uh, deep learning. Uh, network, right? So we, we might uh, increase this epoch to 30 or 50 based on, based on the memory. So all, all this config uh, all this configuration like they have no hard rule and how, how how you should specify it. It's basically based on how 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 your data set how 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 discriminative is your data set and so how well is your your data so yeah, I think these are all just all the hyperparameters that are available. Regularization is applicable when when your model is overfitting. So overfitting means that you overtrain your model so that it is it's too specific that like it is trying to memorize your data set. So at that time you want to provide your um, model to be overfitting, so you can perform some regularization like L1 L2 or the dropouts. So these are this some, some of the things that you might expose to if you are, you are learning something from the things. So there are also some other layers, a preview layers that we have in the approaching. Peep forward, output, formulation, recurrent, and so on. It's all of these different layers for you to actually, um, <coughs> uh, in, in terms of handling different kind of if you are text, then you might need uh, if you are, your input data is in text form, so you might need the current uh, layers. So these are the frequently used class. So <coughs> model fit. So basically this is how how you execute model of fit meaning that you train a model. With, with your data set, model of where you want to generate your model predictions. Evaluation, there, there are some built-in uh, 
you in uh, classes where you can be call and basically help you to complete all your accuracy. Imagine all those bosses right, that I, I showed just now the formula. You don't really need to implement all those formulas because all of these classes is actually available. Uh, model serializer uh, where you can save your model and load the model. Model import and do the real. Model zoom where when people, uh, when the people actually they contribute a lot of pressure models in, into this, this framework. So, for example, uh, later I will, I will run a simple pressure model where you can actually just call a line of code and you load whatever people have, have been trained previously and you can use it as it is. And transfer learning where, where if you have, uh, you see this as some extension of the demon where if you are if someone build a model on, on some some face uh, some space recognition project and you don't want to actually build your model from scratch you can use the review model and then basically modify some of the base so then you can proceed with the training by by utilizing what what people have done previously. So go with some some that uh, if you guys are interested to try it out right so you can actually go uh this are this is the step by step so you need to basically install the uh, java sdk go to the record that i'm right? and then for for today then also i have a two step where the first one is the image classification based on the uh, vision so imagine you have a lot of uh, images like 0 to 9. How, how can you build an uh, image classification model based on this uh, And then the second one is uh, do a basic to invoke a review model and do a project, uh, object detection. Uh, yeah, you need to, uh, if you are used to try out, you need to install the strategy and then import the uh, demo record as a demo project. <coughs> so imagine this is the data set, right? I have uh, I have the uh, I have data for training and testing. So why do we need to uh, uh, specify training and testing data set when we need more? So so basically we don't want to test our model with training data set because it's unfair because your model tends to uh, likely to actually uh, memorize whatever that you're passing. So that's the reason why we look at uh, testing data set. And this is different from um, your, uh, your training so that you can uh, evaluate it in a uh, fair manner. So, so basically, there are 10 classes. So imagine that. For well, this classes zero, right? It's all the zero digit. One is basically one. And so basically, it's just a, a simple, simple uh, So by testing, you have same same structure. You have all your labels and also your your samples. So what what the model trying to do now is to load this training data set and trying to build a model so that so that it can recognize the digits. So let me go through some of the code. <coughs> you guys might not be familiar with this uh, syntax, but I might less code. Uh, <coughs> very quick. So imagine the, the images that we're passing this uh, with width and height 28. 28 times 28 BC. Channel is a risk. Risk meaning that it only has value from 0 to 200. If you have, uh, if you pass in the color images, you have RGB, meaning that you have three channels. But in this uh, test data set, you only have one channel. Risk. Number of output, number of classes that we have. 0 to 9, 10 classes. Best size. So we are training with 
for let's start. Meaning that for each iteration, single uh, for propagation and uh, web propagation, we utilize 50, 54 samples. Default, we only try one to one in this because we have a lot of data. Seed number is just basically hard, hard to make sure that this, this example is reproducible. Okay, so basically, this is the step where we load the data. So, this is just to add the data in the And then, found basically, this is the training, training directory. Then, we're trying to actually um, load the data, the training data. And then, what, what is spiral path label generator means is um, because this is how we have 10 classes, right? It's basically from 0 to 10. So, parent path label generator basically means that for all the samples that you are, you are reading, you know, the, the label is basically the, the subfolder label. Okay? So, imagine that when you load the, this directory, the label will be zero. So this is how we actually um, this is basically how, how the nature of the object, uh, the object that we have, and then this is how we actually uh, load all the data. So this is pretty little. This is the data set, actually. and then we do some uh, preprocessing, meaning that we because because the, the the value is from 0 to 500. So we want to normalize the data from um, uh, normalize the data to 0 to 1. So this is how we feed the, feed the data set. And set as precursor. So, so once you specify this time, all those images, all those value, pixel value, will be uh, scaled to 0 to 1. So basically, this is uh, another step to load the testing data. So this is the learning rate schedule. So I, I can basically specify a uh, static uh, learning rate. But in this example, we feel uh, that uh, <coughs> we notice that by, by providing a different learning rate at different stage, help the model to converge better. So, what this uh, learning rate schedule means is, at this iteration, at zero iteration, the learning rate is zero point zero six. So, once you reach the two hundred iteration, you can basically change the learning rate to be low, so that it converge better. So, ideally, this number, this uh, learning rate is supposed to be lower than the twelve percent. So these are the demo. So see, I don't need to mention this uh, regularization is after regularization just to prevent all So updater is the optimization algorithm. So in this sense we use the method. So don't worry about uh, all this data if you are new. For now, if you we should try out, we can start with item optimizer. So it has proven work in most of the cases, so so you don't really need to uh, need to mess with the program. So you can try to invoke this project and try to do different update uh, if you are, if you wish to try. So this is as simple as if you want to change your optimizer. This is as simple as you change this. I don't know. So imagine that if you want to switch over to a different optimizer or a different proportions, how do you initialize your weight and so on? So basically, it's just with this task. So weight need, so weight need is basically just how you initialize all your weights. So it can, your weight shouldn't be zero because you still remember the, the previous, um, <coughs> the, the perceptron, right? It's the mx plus plus the bias. So imagine your base is all zero, meaning that all your input will be zero. 
because it's time with the pins. So the common practice that people might be using is using a ZB. So ZB is uh, some kind of um, randomization uh, algorithm that you try to randomize a bit in the uh, normal form. Layers where you can specify how how, how your uh, each of your hidden layers look like. So in this case, because we are dealing with images, we use convolution uh, convolution layers in this sense. <coughs> So I, I can't really go through all the um, architecture for the CNN because due to the time limitation. Because if I want to, if I need to cover all those things, it might be take, it might take a lot of time. So in this example, the sky will be like uh, the use of the layer. It's basically a uh, uh, hidden layer for for. Yeah, this is how you specify all your layers. And then the important one is the, the upper layers. So what are you trying to uh, what is your problem right? So we are trying to classify the uh, the uh, the image into 10 class. So it's a multi-class classification. So in this sense you can use soft soft mac activations uh, for your upper layer and negative log value. So this is how uh, the network get constructed in the model. So um, this basically just initialize your your network once you configure it. So you may, uh, imagine once you uh, dot to the right, it basically initialize all your uh, bytes and width and so on. So state storage UI server is basically this just a built-in features for us to actually mon uh, monitor our uh, training process. Uh, I will show you later on once I invoke the, the model training. So, yeah, there are the steps where we specify how many epochs that you want to fit or train the train, train the network. So, this is how we specify 50, 54 as the batch size. set. So, Imagine every time we uh, call the train editor the next, so this data set will be in a batch of 54. So the network, we feed the 54 record into the network. So basically, this is the step where we train. So all the forward propagation and the network propagation will be done, uh, done uh, silently because. We don't really need to manage all the forward and back population. So imagine how 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 this basically is as fast as where I want to how how many times when you look at the uh, confusion uh, metric or the accuracy. So so what I'm doing here is for every ten iteration, I try to print out the, the prediction, see whether it's performed good. Yeah. So at the end of this. Basically, what I did is basically just, just try the train model to, to save the model train. So, yeah, let me try to remove this example. So, from here, you can see that uh, right now I'm utilizing my micro driver. Here, yeah, I'm trying to create my GPUs. So these are the examples of all the results that printed for every 10 iterations. So let me show you the training UI. So basically this is how the training UI looks like. So imagine every iteration, every iteration meaning a batch of 40, uh, for, uh, 54. So you go to So by right your model is supposed to be accomplished at the time. The loss is supposed to be less and less. So training UI is this uh, is just a monitoring tool for you to, to check your gradient and so on. So you can monitor your loss, you can check your weights and uh, gradient. Make sure that uh, this this is where you can actually observe whether your your weights make sense of it. 
So sometimes when you uh, overtrain your model, it might <coughs> it might meet certain circumstances where your grading might explode or go to at the end or down. So this basically is a tool for you uh, to help you to do all this all this parameters. So there are also models where you can actually look into individually. Like you might want to know how many parameters for this this kind of if someone can. So this is the architecture of your of input to output. How many they Yeah, this other um, UI is just to uh, monitor your your RAM or a memory running on the chain. So, so you can see that we have observed that at the end of this room, like, uh, from from 550 to 400, you can see that the the, <coughs> the spike might not be that drastic compared to to other because of the uh, learning schedule that we discussed, right? Just now. So, let's say at 200. From 200, um, from 200 onwards, the learning rate is the work of to, to 0 to 1, uh, 200. So, the, the, the spike uh, might not be that drastic and it, it tends to encourage. So, <coughs> besides the training UI, you can also observe the, the uh, confusion menu. You can see that by right, <coughs> imagine that my, my, all my data points for, for class 0 right, is actually mispredicted as another class. So, this, this, this happened at the very beginning stage. So, imagine that I'm, if I'm going to observe it right now, you can see. It is already uh, learned and, and converged method in the sense where most of the class 0 is pretty as and one is pretty as So you can see how, how the model works throughout the actual process. Yeah, so this is the first example that I have. Let's proceed with. Um, the next example, if no question. Yeah. Is there a possibility when you overtrain the model? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, <coughs> so, okay, in this sense, uh, for, for sure, if you didn't provide any regularization or any, any control of your model, right, it tends to get more if you, you if you put a, uh, you increase the input. So, imagine that the model is trying to memorize all the data, trying to see it's cheating. So in order to, uh, to avoid all so you need to provide a test data set. As in, your data set cannot be your training data set. So that you can check for those unseen data points, right? How well is it? If you, are, if you get your accuracy at 8%, and also your training accuracy is also at 8%, then you need that you are doing Like three days from training one, like how do you know how you 